Okay. All right, guys. So, so let's talk a little bit about what happened over the weekend, right? What this ultimately means. So, whether you think the governor was making good decisions or not making good decisions, that really doesn't matter. That's not the issue. The issue is that we don't have a system that allows for a dictatorship. And I know that that may sound harsh, a dictatorship, but really when we define dictatorship, it's one individual dictating policy, right? Without any outside or any other entity to check that. Well, of course, the courts have stepped in, and the legislature had said all along that, uh, that the governor didn't have the authority to unilaterally act under this emergency. I think that the legislature is able to do their job. And if you think about that, that should make sense to individuals. You would give the president or the governor emergency power if the legislature can't do its job, right? During riots, during catastrophes, where snap decisions need to be made, and it doesn't make sense to the health and safety of the community to bring everybody together and try to hash out a good plan. You put that power in the hands of the president or, in our case, the governor. But we were in a situation where, yes, we have this virus going on, and yes, it's dangerous, but it hasn't stopped the legislature from the ability to do its job, to come in, to debate, to discuss, right, to send it over to the two chambers, to have committees, to meet either virtually or in person, and then to pass policy on to the governor for her to either sign or veto, send back, and say, well, you need to change this to negotiate. That's our legislative process, our representative democracy. Our representatives are there working with the government, the head of the government being the governor, to ensure that it doesn't go cuckoo, tyrannical. And some would argue that mandating masks to kindergartners was a little bit over the line. Making kids who are playing soccer outside wear masks is a little bit out of the line, right? Some would argue that. Not everybody, but some would. And so, without having the ability to have that debate and that discussion and tell your representatives what you think about that, that's the dictatorship. The governor is making those decisions unilaterally under the guise that there's this emergency that really hasn't really kept us from doing what we're doing now. We're, we're, we're in a classroom together. So what kind of emergency is this? So the Supreme Court correctly came out and said that 1945 Emergency Act, that law in and of itself, is unconstitutional. And it really wasn't even that the governor herself was acting unconstitutionally is that the law that provided the governor that power was unconstitutional. The legislature should have never given that law to the governor as it was written, or he said it was interpreted. Now again, we give the President of the United States emergency powers. The governor should have emergency powers, but the ability to, both as the governor, to declare an emergency and then to continue to declare that emergency and act unilaterally, that, that was cutting out the legislature and really thwarting the idea of representative democracy. It was unconstitutional at its core. At the core of our system is the ability for you and I to elect people to represent our interests when dealing with government. And they were being cut out of that process. And so they sued. And ultimately, it really wasn't even, the, legis the, uh, the state Supreme Court wasn't answering the question regarding the legislature uh, in their lawsuit, basically saying we've been cut out of this process, but there were um, a couple of hospitals that um, were questioning, had sued the governor uh, based upon the governor's executive order that kept them from doing you know, surgery, surgeries that weren't determined to be uh, absolutely necessary at the time. And that was in federal court. And the federal court then deferred to the state Supreme Court and said, hey, can you, can you give us some, some background here? Is this or is this not constitutional at the state level for us to begin considering and so the state Supreme Court ruled with an opinion, right, which is their, their determination of what the Constitution means, their opinion, that it was unconstitutional and that the governor was acting in an unconstitutional manner. So the right decision was made, that ruling was made. Now the governor then came back and said, well, that ruling needs to be filed, and needs, you know, I's need to be dotted, P's need to be crossed, and there's a 21-day period so until that takes effect. No point no. Right? No bueno. When the court comes out and says these acts are unconstitutional, they're unconstitutional. Now, the governor may try to continue to enforce them, but I don't know of a court, and even the attorney general, right, Dana Nessel, who's, who's the attorney general for the state, even she came out and said, I'm not, we're not pursuing anybody who's not paying, uh, not paying heed to these executive orders that came out post-April 30th. Why post-April 30th? 
Well, there's another law in place that the court didn't strike down as unconstitutional, but said that the governor, because she's been operating under the 45 law, has been acting unconstitutional since. There's a 1976 law, which makes more sense, that says the governor has these emergency powers, but then after 28 days, so they're limited, after 28 days, she has to come back to the legislature and, again, reapply for those emergency powers, so to speak. And the legislature can either allow her to or not. And for, the, and for the first 28 days and the second 28 days, the legislature said, yeah, yeah, we support you, right? But uh, after that, or actually it was the first 28 days, and then it was a limited amount of time beyond that. It wasn't another full 28 days. And then at the end of that period of time, when the legislature she came back to the legislature, the legislature said, no, we're not going to afford you those unilateral powers anymore. We retain our rights. Let's work on this together. Let's do what we're supposed to do in this build, formula, adopt, implement, and evaluate process. And that's when the governor said, well, it really doesn't matter what you do. We're going to have this 1976 law. I have this 1945 law, which gives me, you know, these, these almost unlimited powers. I'm just going to continue with those. And that's what we've been operating on ever since April 30th. And it's been incorrect. And thankfully, thankfully, the court came out it said it wasn't even a uni right. It wasn't. It wasn't a, a unanimous decision from our state supreme court. There were still three of the seven state supreme court judges said, "No, no, no. She she can continue to do this. This is okay." And, and luckily, there were four state supreme court judges who said, "No, no, no. This this, this, this goes against the core of a representative democracy." All right. We elect individuals to represent our interests to be our voice. And yes, we elect the governor too, but she's the top of the of the government, right? The executive, the chief executive. And that legislative branch is what directs the government as to what to do. And when you cut them out, you cut out the voice of the people, right? So it was a good decision. We should all be happy with that decision, regardless of whether we thought that the government was doing a fine job in trying to protect us, that wasn't the issue. Whether we thought that um, this is a partisan issue, it's you know, Republicans versus Democrats, that shouldn't be the issue either. Flip it around, right? Flip it around. If, if Donald Trump, right? If you don't care for Donald Trump. He was our governor. Right? Would you want him to have the universal unilateral power? Right? Would you want the next Republican governor to have that same power to say, this is a, an emergency. We're going to declare an emergency. Now I'm going to make decisions by executive order, and we're going to have the following two penalty of, of, of law. Would you want anybody to have that, regardless of the party? We've got, so take the partisanship out of it. Take the idea of whether they were good decisions or bad decisions out of it, and applaud the fact that we've retained this idea of separation of powers and true representative democracy, where your representatives that you elect, that your parents have elected to represent their interests, are in their position to do that. Now, hopefully, they come out and they together come up with good common sense, maybe even follows along with what the governor was already doing, right? But at least our representatives are at the table. So it's a good day. It's a good decision. Now, there's a couple other decisions out there, right? <clears throat> so there's a, I'm not, without getting too much into this, you, might, you guys want to know a lot more about state government? Take my state and local class, right? But as far as what's going on in Michigan, heading up to election time, you have a, a, a judge, an appointed judge, who who is um, just the gateway to the state Supreme Court, basically. It's, called, it's the Court of Claims. And uh, the first hearing of, of kind of constitutional questions will go through the Court of Claims. Um, there was a challenge because of COVID to when election ballots had to be in and when they had to be counted. And this judge, this appointed judge of the Court of Claims, uh, Judge Stevens, has, has ruled that, um, that the current laws in place are unconstitutional because of COVID. And so... There has to be an extension of when ballots received will be counted. And she came up with this extra, uh, basically two weeks of time. I think it's well, maybe 11 days. So I think it's the 14th of November that anything, right, that's received after the election up to these, up to the 14th of November will be counted as if it was cast the same day. And that's to allow for the, what, what is perceived to be the problems with the postal service the deluge of people who are going to be voting by mail because of COVID versus voting in person. It's October, right? When this ruling came out, it was September still. 
if you're worried that your bailout's not going to get there in time, mail it now. Right? We have the ability to mail our ballots now. So this, this idea of just extending it beyond, which goes beyond what the legislature has designated as reasonable um, and, uh, and, and with the integrity of our elections in mind, um, well, that's what the Judge, Judge Stevens has indicated as being unconstitutional. The other is something called ballot, it's not ballot harvesting, but it's the ballot delivery, which allows for ballot harvesting. But that's to allow anybody to pick up your ballot and deliver your ballot. The problem with that is when you don't put it in the post box or when you don't take it to the clerk and drop it off by hand, is someone, an intermediary, who takes your ballot from you, right? They can do anything with that ballot. And yeah, the postmaster or, or the, the, excuse me, the post uh, deliverer could as well, but it's much more unlikely than an individual who drives around offering the service to Brian or Javon or to Jal. I'll pick up your ballot and take them in for you. And more nefarious than that, right, because you're dropping the ballots off, you're not the exact individual who got the ballot, is that what we've seen in, in Minnesota, what we've seen in Texas, maybe not to a large degree, but sometimes it's tip of the iceberg stuff, right? We don't know what we don't know. But in what we've seen in Texas, what we've seen in Minnesota, is individuals paying for those ballots. Now, you get a ballot, you got one mailed to you because you checked the box, and you said, I don't, you know, I don't normally vote, we already showed that about 60%. 60% of population votes in presidential elections, so there's 40% of eligible voters who aren't voting. But we're flooding these ballots out there without people actually actually requesting them, so to speak. Yes, yes, you had to check the box, you had to check the box, you get it for the primary, you get it for the general. That's a lot of ballots that are coming out. Versus the way we've done it in the past, absentee voting is, you want an absentee ballot, you make the request for the absentee ballot. That way we keep some handle on how many ballots are going out, what to expect coming back in. Regardless, flooding these ballots out there, right? 60% vote, 40% don't. If I go up to you and you're not a normal voter and go, hey, I'll give you $200 for your ballot. What sweat is it off your back? I wasn't going to vote anyway. I'll take 200 bucks. Now I fill it out, all right? Sign right here, Brian. There's your name. I'll take care of the rest. That's ballot harvesting. And there's no integrity in that. And so, opening up our election process for other individuals to collect ballots, again, challenges the integrity. Does it, does, does it come to, to, to fruition that that will happen? I don't know. But it certainly opens it up for it. And again, this is a decision that's not legal by legislative process in Michigan, but by the court determining our current laws are unconstitutional because of this guys of COVID. That's a big problem. Now this will ultimately end up in the court. I'm hopeful that the court recognizes that in your U.S. Constitution, it is the state legislature and only the state legislature that determines how our electors are appointed. And our electors currently are appointed through this process of you and I going and voting for our electors come election day. You think you vote for president. You don't vote for president. You vote for the electors who then choose your president. Now there's a direct connection to that. Right? But today's lecture will get us into at least the tip of the Electoral College. Right? But when you and I go and vote, we're voting for the people who choose the electors on our behalf. That's how we appoint our, lecture, our electors, and that is a power through the U.S. Constitution that is given solely to the state legislature. So I'm hopeful that the state legislature says, hey, Judge Stevens, you, you might be able to um, have all those ballots come in whenever you want to for all those elections other than the electoral college. But when it comes to the electoral college, we've set the standards for that. And, uh, and that's within the U.S. constitutional protected rights. And so that's a fight that still has to take place, but we'll see it ultimately play out. Again, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you're voting for, right? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're a Dem, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, it doesn't matter if you're a Libertarian, at the end of the day, you at the very least want your vote to count. And you want integrity and legitimacy in this election system. It has to be there for it to be accepted. Right? If we assume, and this, this came up in the debate as well, um, back to that Proud Boys thing, right? Which I, hope, I told you guys, right, there's going to be follow from that. There certainly has been over the weekend, but some things certainly to clarify as well. It was, it was Chris Wallace that established the phrasing 
of stand down. That was the term he used, stand down. And President Trump, in trying to comply and agree, as he had done a number of times already, that he does not support white supremacy, uh, to tell what group, who, whom, and somebody piped out, Proud Boys, Proud Boys, stand back, stand aside, or whatever he ultimately said. The phraseology was stand down. He didn't say it, but if you watch the, right, it's not that he wasn't trying to say it, but that was blown, I think, out of proportion. And then you have the Proud Boys come out, and the national director of the Proud Boys, who happens to be a Cuban, but uh, dark skin, says, uh, we're not white supremacists. Uh, pretty legit there, right? So, I mean, pretty hard to argue that, uh, you know, unless you Dave Chappelle. <laughs> anyway, so, but also during that, that uh, interaction, um, the um, president was, was talking about accepting the outcome of an election. And his point was the same point it was four years ago. I'll accept the outcome of the election unless there is these huge discrepancies of, of votes coming in and, and, uh, and vote ballot harvest, and I don't disagree with him. And it should, not only should he not accept that, Nobody should accept an election like that, regardless if it's Joe Biden who wins or President Trump who wins. If there are is these discrepancies that make the election seem illegitimate, that undermines our representative democracy. Again, and we can't have that. You just can't have that. So for the sake of the integrity of elections, let's put in place these you know, catch-alls that allow us to have confidence in the outcome regardless of whether we like the end, of, the end of the outcome or not. I, mean, I, don't, I don't care who, you know, you know, I do care who gets elected. I have my choice in the individual I'd like to see elected, but at the end of the day, if the other guy wins, and it's on the up and up, and the Electoral College favors this individual, it is what it is. We'll get him four years from now. Right? We'll work it out four years from now. That's the way our system should work. And remember, though we're starting to get You'd argue we're starting to get more and more polarized. More and more polarized. The population still hugs the center. The vast majority of the population still hugs the center. And so that keeps the candidates somewhat close to the center. Right? Even though the parties may seek to pull them further out, further out, the population keeps it going back and forth close to the center. Allows for change, but not radical change. Right? I mean, ultimately, it allows for change, but not radical change. That's at least the system by design and the pendulum swing. And kind of an interesting thing if you watch it, too. Our country is pretty evenly split, as we've said. Michigan is pretty evenly split as well. You know, it's a purple state. Calhoun County is a kind of a purple county. Um, you know, it runs down, runs. Well, as you guys found out, uh, one of your representatives that represents the county, Jim Hodgman, he's a Democrat, and the other representative who represents the county is Matt Hall, he's a Republican. So, again, it's reflective of Calhoun. Calhoun's reflective of the state. The state's really reflective of the country. And uh, what, what tends to happen, right, to draw our ideological spectrum, right, this is our equality side, our freedom side, this is the center, kind of center right is the nation. And, uh, and the majority of people are in the center. The political parties, however, they are not right up to the center. Right? The political parties just hang outside just a little bit. This is our independence. Okay? Our independence. However, even though they're independent, there's no gaps here. So this would be our Republicans. These would be our Democrats. But the political parties themselves, they're a little further left and a little further right. Okay? Because the idea of do you want more government or less government is much more clear than it is right here in the center. Does this make sense to everybody so far? Yes? We? Yes? All right? Yes? All right. So we've got these political parties then who establish their principles and establish that and have support from uh, their the communities, the party supporters, the candidates, which are going to be chosen from among their ranks. Okay? And these are the individuals who are going to be chosen from the political parties. And then we're going to elect them. And depending on who has the most you know, votes, who gets the most members in, the House of Representatives or the Senate is going to be controlled by the D's or the R's. This is who's going to control these two chambers. 
depending on numbers. It's a numbers game. All right, so if the Senate gets more Republicans, which it has now, it's going to be controlled by the Republican Party. If the House gets more Democrats, which it has now, it's going to be controlled by the Democrat Party. So we have a split legislature right now. But let's say the Democrats pick up the Senate. Now it's all D's, right? Well, with that, if you remember where the individuals come from, you're eventually what tends to happen is left to their own devices, either the D's or the R's, they'll, they'll pull policy from what's acceptable to their political party, from their ranks. And that's a lot further left than what the majority of the population wants. Does that make sense? You see that? So the party, this is where the candidates come from, right? right? It's hard to get an R&D who's a centrist, get them through the primary process, and then get them elected right? in our two-party system. It happens. I'm not saying it, happens. it doesn't happen. It happens. But it's, it's not like a Susan Collins, for example, out of Maine. She's a good centrist Republican. Right? People might argue Mitt Romney is a good centrist Republican. Uh, um, the, the senator from West Virginia is a centrist Democrat, right? So these different, it happens, but the majority of individuals who then begin to control policy coming out, they're either going to come from further left or further right or center. And it alienates enough individuals. And so what ultimately happens is this group of individuals who controls the outcome of elections, really, Republicans vote Republican, Dems vote Dem. This group of individuals who really control the outcome of the election, they get tired. And they pull it back the other way. They're too far out, they're too far left, they're too far right, and they pull it the other way. That's why we get the majority, right, controlling the House, controlling the Senate, changing hands. A president who's a Republican one year, four years later, now it's a Democrat president, and back and forth we go. Because, again, the population, particularly in the center, the, the decisions that are being made are too far right or too far left for the center. And they ultimately control the outcome of the election. And so we get this realignment, reestablishment, uh, pulling back as the pendulum swings. Okay, so to our to this to this point to this point, all right. We watched that. I'm just a bill. Scary how technically correct that is. All right, all this time and a catchy little tune to go with it. But you've got the uh, the House and the Senate, the spot to remember is build, formulate, adopt, implement, and evaluate. And these steps here, this is your Article 1 of your Constitution. This is Article 2. And did you notice how much shorter Article 2 is than Article 1? Right? The idea that the power was going to be in the hands of the public, the people, and then through their representatives... That's where the emphasis is in the Constitution, that the power of deciding what the problems are and what the right solution is, right? That's the who gets what process. That power in the hands of the people through the representatives, that's why that portion of the Constitution is so thick. Who's going to be elected? How are we going to divvy up these votes? And then what can they work on? What do the states have to give up to allow this Congress to do these things, right? What are they going to do together? That's all part of Article One. Article 2 then gets us into the executive branch, the implementation part. And that, that part is a lot thinner. Your job really is to carry out what these guys tell you to do. And yeah, there's some checks and balances. Pardon power, veto power, appointment power. There's some checks and balances between these two branches. And then you're going to come to find that Article 3 is even shorter than Article 2. The court's job. The court's job is to make sure that these two entities are, are on the same page ultimately. That was really the reason for the courts. If there's a true reason for the courts that seems rational and makes sense, it's that these two equally powerful branches need a referee. Right? Right. Say yes. No. No. No, no. I say yes. You say yes. So you say yes. Right. Say yes. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. We can do this all day long. And if you're the legislature and I'm the executive branch, who decides who's right here? Come on. You come in and you say, okay, what did the legislature tell you to do? 
They told me to do X. What are you doing? I'm doing X. The legislature says, no, you're not. You're doing Y. And I'm the executive and say, well, I'm doing X as I understand it. That's what we need you. That third party to come in, the court to come in and say, Brian's right. You're, you're not doing it correctly. You need to, right? The legislature's right, Governor. You're not doing it correctly. You've got to do it this way. That's the proper role for the courts. Now, the role of the court has expanded. Some would say it was intended to. Others would say, mm, not, maybe not. But it has expanded to be more than just the referee between the legislature and the executive branch. It's come to include, well, can the legislature even do this? Right? Could the legislature even give that power to the governor? And the court came out and said, no. The legislature didn't have that authority. Right? So that's... The power of the court goes beyond just the referee between the two. It's the understanding the whole rules. Are you even playing by the rules? The rule book being the Constitution, the rule book on how to govern the Constitution. That's the rule of the courts. But we'll see Article 3 is even smaller than Article 2. Bill, formulate, adopt, implement, and evaluate, right? BFAIE. And how do we do this? Okay. This structure, this bicameral structure. So I want to just talk about So this is government. This is how government operates. And I want to go back to talking about you and empowering you and where you fit in and all this. Of course, you choose these individuals, represent democracy. You choose them. That's the whole voting thing. You even choose the executive, right? That's the whole voting thing. But beyond just voting... What power do you have? Where can, where, can you, where can you amplify your voice? And that, as I told you guys, is through your interest groups. And remember way back we, had, we defined ideology, right? Your comprehensive set of beliefs. About, that's ideology. Now, political ideology, right? Political ideology is your comprehensive set of beliefs about the role of government. What is the role of government? The role of government is to decide who gets what. And more, it structures society, but the allocation of resources, right? That's the role of government. And how should government do this? Right? What do you believe government, how do you believe government should do this? Should government have a heavy hand, should government be light? Should we have more government, less government? How, how do you believe government should allocate? Should there be limits to what government can allocate and not allocate? What about private property? Who owns what? Who has to, right? All of those are questions, beliefs, right? Beliefs about how government should operate. When you take all of those beliefs together, you get to an ideology. So it's not just one belief. It's these beliefs taken together give you an ideology about government. And then what you'll come to find is that when you take all these beliefs about government, right, what it's supposed to do, it'll fall to the one side or the other of freedom or equality. It'll fall to these two values, two ends, the poles on our ideological spectrum. If it's equality, it's going to be more government is necessary, but okay, because we're going to reallocate or allocate better and ensure that the allocation is done and make sure that there's nobody cheating in the allocation, that everybody gets an equal share or equal access. That takes a lot of government and oversight. Does that make sense? All right. So if your ideology falls to the equality side, to the left side, all right, there's going to be degrees of government you're more comfortable with. And if you ask all these questions about property and taxation and business rights and and uh, the inequality that comes from capitalism, and you believe in the individual freedom, you're going to fall to the right side, to less government, to the freedom side. And so you're going to have this ideology that's freedom-centric or equality-centric. And now how thick, right, how much, that's just going to depend on your ideology. And as we pointed out, people in the United States fall just right of center. Healthy distrust of government. Recognition that it's necessary, absolutely necessary, but a healthy distrust of government. 
And so that's where people's ideologies are. And again, this is everybody. You may be over here. You may be over here. You may be over here. You may be right in the center. This is everybody. Okay? I like to think of it like a, like a stew. And so you start getting asked questions about government or soup. You start getting asked questions about government, and you, and you put this ingredient. It's like, hey, you think government should do this? Yes, no. All right? And that becomes an ingredient of your soup. You think government should do this? Yes or no? That becomes an ingredient of your soup. And then when you boil that all down, you're left with this flavor. Either it's a very heavy fake flavor of, of freedom, or it's a heavy flavor of equality, or something in the middle. Right? Not devoid of, of either, most likely something in the middle. How, how heavy is that flavor of freedom, or how heavy is that flavor of equity in your ideology? Okay. So what makes up these beliefs? Where do these beliefs come from? Where do these beliefs come from? Right? Beliefs, they're not innate. Right? You're, not, you're not born with specific beliefs about good government or bad government. Maybe, maybe born with innate understanding of fairness, I would argue morality, understanding that there's truth, I mean, those things may be innate within us. But the idea that government should do this and this, or that private proper capitalism or Marxism are good things, those aren't beliefs that anybody's born with. So where do those beliefs come from? And in my sociology class, we would call this socialization, where we, where we get our beliefs, nature, nurture. And the greatest impact on your beliefs, at least initially, and and sociologists would argue throughout life the biggest impact upon your belief is your parents. Those individuals who have you early on, first, where you're malleable, where you're wet, where you're, where you're clay that's moldable, malleable. And if I get you early enough, we can shape you in your beliefs, right, to things that, uh, um, that, we, that would, would reflect what our beliefs are and what our interests are as parents. Right? So usually younger individuals tend to follow the footsteps of their parents. That makes sense, right? But at some point in time, and you've probably already experienced it, you begin to challenge your parents' views. Not that you're necessarily challenging your parents or your parents' intelligence, but you're beginning to challenge based upon your understanding that as an adult, you're going to have to make decisions without your parents' help. And so you begin to test and to rebel a little bit and to push and to question those beliefs. So you can get an own sense, your own sense of what's right, what's not, based upon not being told, but experience. I need to see this. I need to do this. And you begin to push back a little bit. Well, that's how our beliefs come about. One, through those forces we would call proximate forces that tell us and shape us, and then later on, Right? Our, our own experiences, testing those beliefs, coming up with new understandings, non-proximate forces like media, right? educational textbooks that give us information that maybe our parents didn't have or maybe had wrong, or at least had, maybe don't have wrong, but are being right, conflicted by what we're being presented with from a textbook. You have to begin to test that now. Who are you going to accept as correct in this? And that's how we ultimately gain those beliefs. And from those beliefs, our ideology. The old adage is, if you're young and you're not liberal, you got no heart. And if you're older and you're not conservative, you got no brain. And that's not to denigrate anybody. What it's basically saying is that younger individuals who are still trying to right, gain an understanding and, and, and have this belief True, truly believe that they have the power within them to change the world, why not change the world? And then as individuals get older, they either change the world to what they want it to be, or they live in the world that they understand, and that change becomes either more difficult or less, I don't know, less tempting. And so older individuals tend to be more conservative, keep things the way they are. I spent my lifetime getting to where it is, or getting myself to where I am. I don't need to change it now. And younger individuals think with altruistic thoughts of, why don't we do it this way? How can we don't do it this way? We could do it this way. Wouldn't it be better? And either their position changes, their life circumstances change, 
or they spend a number of years, a long enough time within a current system that they get pretty good at working within it. And once they've gotten good at working within it, why do you want it to change? Right? So conservatives, liberals. All right. So from these beliefs, when it comes to uh, where our beliefs come from, we can, over time, the individuals that who are helping to shape our beliefs really shape our beliefs less and less, and we begin to find, to flock to individuals who have similar beliefs. We tend to surround ourselves when we have the ability, the mobility, the ability to seek out and find individuals that share our beliefs, that share our understandings, that share our truths. And there's comfort in that, and there's protection and security in that. The whole idea of birds of a feather flocking together. We tend to, we're tribal, right? We tend to tribe up. We try to be, these are my people, right? I can trust them. They think like I think. They do what I do. What I do. This, is, this is what I'm comfortable with, and there's safety in that. I think that that's instinctual, right? It's not just human, that's animal. And we do that. And so we seek out individuals who share our interests. And those are our interest groups. And any interest group, any interest group has the ability to become a political interest group simply when it cha changes its interest or changes its um, in, uh, its interest, changes its, um, um, puts its sights on, here we go, puts its sights on changing policy. Right? So an interest group that wants to change policy through the political process we're going to become a political interest group. Now, a lot of political interest groups are easy. This is what they do. Their job is to apply pressure to key officials in government to shape policy for the benefit of the group. A definition of political interest group, a pig. I like that. A pig, right? What makes them a political interest group is that they apply pressure to key officials in government to shape policy to the benefit of the interest group. Right? Interest groups, ideology, beliefs. That's you. That's you. It's you. That's you taking your beliefs, taking your interests, joining with other individuals who share those interests, and amplifying your voice to apply pressure to key officials in government to shape policy to your interest. If you're a hunter, right? if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're an architect, if you're a, a union man, if you're an environmentalist, if you own your own business, right? if you're a, a, a classic car enthusiast, if you're a bowler, all of those interests have the potential of becoming political interest groups or, or being part of the political interest group scene simply based upon what policies are being passed. Okay, it's safe, for example, in the state of Michigan, right? Bowling alleys were hurt by these executive orders about how many individuals you can have in, and you know, bingo halls were allowed to have individuals, bars were allowed to have individuals in, but not bowling alleys. Well, you wouldn't think about bowlers as being very political, but when the decisions of government are having an impact upon the interest, they become political. NRA, Right to Life, Sierra Club, PETA, Greenpeace, all examples of interest groups. And they do a pretty good job of focusing their members' voices on those key officials in government to shape policy to the benefit of the group. There's power in that. That's, again, I know I've already told you guys this, but remember, interest groups, amplify your voice. There's power there. Let them do the heavy lifting and applying that pressure to key officials and government. You vote them in, help your interest groups, push them to good policy. All right? So, who are these key officials in government? Right, the ones identifying the problem and coming up with the solutions. Your legislators. Yes, your executive as well. Yes, possibly some of the bureaucrats. But for the most, because bureaucrats do have rulemaking powers, which, which to the chagrin of many, because oftentimes they're not elected individuals and not accountable um, to the electorate the same way our representatives are. 
um, or even our chief executive, the president or the governor. But these key officials in government tend to be your legislators, and they're the ones who get lobbied. Lobby being the term, uh, or lobbying being the term of the supplying of pressure. Right? How do we apply pressure lobby? Lobbyists are professional pressure appliers. The lobbyists. Okay? And they apply pressure to key officials in government. Here's what you need to know. This is government. All right? So this is your legislature. It's the executive branch. Primarily your executive branch, by the way. Your legislature is supposed to shape government and push government left and right. But your government is, uh, we, we consider government to be all three branches, and anybody who kind of gets a paycheck on the public dole tends to be what we call a member of government. Regardless, government is, uh, is this entity, entity you're trying to push left, push right when it comes to policy. Political parties, the R's and the D's, Their goal, particularly if you're an R or a D, your goal is to win government. To win government. That's your goal. And how do you win government? We told you, it's a numbers game. You win government by getting your members elected. And if I can get more R's elected than D's, then I will control this portion of government. If I get more D's elected than R's, then I will control this portion of government. If I get an R in the White House, the R's control the White House. If I get a D in the White House, the D's control the White House. It's a, it's a numbers game. It's an election game. And the goal of the political parties is to win government by winning the seats, winning the numbers. And you say, well, what do you win when you win government? You win a brand new car. Yeah. No, you gotta say no. Yeah, you want to buy a new car. You want to... Look, government decides who gets what. All right, you get a you get a legislator in the office who says, you know, college is pretty tough, and not being able to get to college is one of the reasons people don't go to college. So, what I'm proposing as policy is that any 16 to 21 year old who chooses to go to college will be given an automobile to the system to get there. All right. So, I like you. You give me a new car. When you win, when you win government, brand new car. Right? So the possibility is there. Or free college or something like that. I'm getting lit up in my pockets by the way. Um, at any rate, the, uh, the, the point is true. Because when it comes to the allocation of resources, that could be anything. And so winning government is important. Because government decides who gets what. Government structure society. It's a big deal. You're all part of the game. So, choosing a political party, being a part of an interest group, pressuring government, winning government, but then pressuring government, pushing it to the right, and then coming to find that there's an equal number of interest groups or interests who oftentimes push government to the left. It seems like for every issue, there's a counter issue. For every interest group, there's a counter interest group. Right? Those who support gun rights, those who support, that don't support gun rights, those who support uh, um, the environment, uh, environmental protection, those who you know, favor industry. There tends to be these counter positions on every issue that's controversial, which makes for valuable obvious. It makes a lot of rich. All right. Questions about any of this? Setting the groundwork here? Okay. And your part in all of this? Your ability to, one, vote the political parties, be active in the political parties, getting involved in the political primaries, choosing the candidates before they go out to the full general electorate for election, involving yourself with the interest groups, know thyself, choose those interest groups and be a part of them. Add to their voice, which then works to pressure government to your interests. Build and formulate and adopt it. What do they do? That's identifying the problems and coming up with the solutions. Bicameral legislature. Problem comes in, goes immediately to committee. From committee, it comes out. Right. Remember that if the R's, this is important, if the R's control 
by numbers, the House of Representatives, they don't right now, the D's do. Um, so I guess we'll just make it these. Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. And interesting to know, political parties aren't mentioned in your Constitution, right? Later on in the amendments there, but not the original Constitution. We, like Madison says, anyway, we tried to try to work around the, 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 the political parties, to keep the political parties out of it, which was ridiculous, because we started out with political parties that, that align themselves with either supporting the Constitution or keeping things the way they were. The anti federalists and the federalists. But regardless, the idea was to keep, kind of keep the parties out of the Constitution. And, uh, and so the Speaker of the House, they're not partisan. What? They're not partisan. Yeah, they are. They don't have to be. The Speaker of the House is the individual chosen by all of the House members. And I assume, I have to go back to the Constitution, but I assume that you could pick someone from even outside the legislature to be your Speaker of the House if that's what the members of the legislature wanted to do. Generally speaking, though, you choose from your ranks, but it always comes down to if it's more Dems than Republicans, the Dems will, the Speaker of the House will be a Dem. If there are more Republicans than Dems, the Speaker of the House will be a Republican. And why is that? Well, political parties, right? So what is there six, seven, seven individuals, six, seven individuals, seven individuals, four, five individuals over here? So you've got more, you got the numbers, right? So we're going to choose, you're my House of Representatives, we're going to choose the Speaker of the House. How are we going to do that? Well, you guys are going to get together, and you're going to pick that one individual from your ranks who will be your Speaker of the House. And then you'll go about trying to get some of these individuals across the aisle to support your Speaker of the House. It isn't going to happen. You guys will get together, and you'll choose from among your ranks who's going to be the Speaker of the House. Right? And once you pick that individual, then it goes up for a vote. Everybody over here votes for this candidate. Everybody over here votes for this candidate, and you do the numbers, and you go, well, you got the most votes. You're Speaker of the House. Right? Doesn't have to be a D, doesn't have to be an R. It's going to be a D, or it's going to be an R because of numbers. So if the numbers change in the House of Representatives, 435 House members. If those numbers change in the House of Representatives, get more R's than D's, the next Speaker of the House is going to be an R, most likely. What about in the Senate? Who's the leader of the Senate? The well, leader of the Senate is the Vice President. Right? The constitutional leader of the Senate is the Vice President. He's not really the functional leader of the Senate. The functional leader of the Senate is the Senate Majority Leader. Majority, we're talking numbers again. right? So the Majority Leader is of the party that has the most people in it, has the most senators in it. And currently, the Republicans control the Senate. So Mitch McConnell is the Republican majority leader. It's a numbers game. Why is that so important? Well, remember, identifying problems, coming up with solutions, and in this process of working legislation through, the calendar, what amendments, what bills come up, is all based upon the whims of the party in charge. So my R's, my D's, you can introduce any legislation you want. That's your right. That's your power as a legislator. We want you to introduce legislation. And you can introduce any legislation you want. But when it comes time to begin working on that legislation and passing it through and getting it on the calendar and getting it to the point where it's going to be amended, substituted, and passed to the full chamber, you guys control the calendar. Right? So your issues are the issues that need to be addressed. So if it's the environment, if it's issues of equity, if it's issues of uh, workers' rights, those are going to be the issues that are going to be worked on. And when you guys are throwing in legislation about protecting the Second Amendment and protecting the rights of the unborn, those aren't necessarily going to get picked up because they're not priorities of the other party, the other group of individuals. And they're in control. They control which bills come up. They control which amendments get passed. They control which substitutions get added in or get, get passed, which amendments get added in. And then when a bill comes out of committee, they control all of that. So then it comes to the full floor. Again, it's still a numbers game. Numbers win. It can be pushed through on a 
purely partisan vote. You hear that from time to time. But here's what happens. Now it goes over to the next chamber, in our case, the Senate. Well, the Senate's not controlled by the Ds. The Senate's controlled by the Rs. It's not filibuster proof. So not a lot gets done. Right? We've, we've watched this last two years with the uh, House controlled by the Democrats, the Senate controlled by the Republicans. Not much has gotten done. And anything that does get done has this kind of knockdown, drag out, game of chicken, last minute, kind of cobbled together legislation. Why doesn't anything get done? Because you've got D priorities getting passed on to a party that doesn't have the same priorities, right? That even if they wanted to put some R priorities in here, you've got a filibuster potential from the minority to stop the, you know, the Republicans, in this case, from passing any legislation that they want to. And even when the House was controlled by the Republicans, the Republicans still didn't have a filibuster-proof majority. So this last four years, things have gotten done. Um, but it's been a knockdown, drag out, really grind to a halt process. And some would say that's a good thing. If the majority of people are in the center, and this split legislature means that no one party gets to ram stuff through, then maybe what we're actually getting out of the government when it does get through is actually some pretty good policy, at least policy that tends to make the, the, the everybody unhappy. <laughs> All right. The committee is controlled by the Republicans, and then again, we have to have a vote on it. Maybe there's a filibuster, maybe we get cloture. Remember, whatever comes in has to come out. It's got to be the exact same. And if it's not the exact same, it's got to go back to the chamber of origination for them to agree to those changes. And if they can't agree, which more often than not they don't, it'll go to what's called the conference committee. Where we can take our differences and try to come up with a compromise. If we can do that, that's what will get pushed down to the executive for passage or not. Just because we've adopted policy does not mean it's going to be implemented. That's the power of the executive. So implementation is in Article 2. We elect the President of the United States to oversee the implementation of this policies, of these policies, of these solutions to these problems. That's the chief job of the President. To execute faithfully, right? The Constitution of the United States, which allows for Article One, the legislature to do very specific things. I know it's become very broad now, that's your court interpretation, but it's very specific initially regarding weights and measures and and uh, and supporting the military and guarding the shores and international trade. Right? If we wanted to take a look at the role of the federal government initially. Take a look at its divisions in the bureaucracy. The original bureaucracy of the federal government was basically three divisions. There's a fourth, if you include the attorney general. I'm sure it becomes the justice department. But the first three divisions of the federal government, which really helped to encapsulate the mission of the federal government, what it was intended to do, was the Department of State, the Department of Treasury, and the Department of War, not defense. But that was it, State, Treasury, and War. And they had to get the Attorney General. But State, Treasury, and War, that was the scope of the federal government. And the power of the executive to carry out those federal or national duties that affected all states with a common voice of dealing with foreign governments, a common currency and common trade within the United States, and then a common defense for defending the states from within, but also from without. That was your scope of the federal government. And now we've got Justice Department and then some 11 or 12 other divisions. We've got education, health and human services. Housing, we've got labor, we've got energy, we've got environment, we've got transportation, we've got the interior, we've got homeland security, 
we've grown the scope of the federal government without really growing the Constitution. Okay. So through this bureaucracy, we the, the process is typical of any you know top-down management style Fortune 500 company. You have a president, vice president. We don't call them vice presidents, we call them secretaries, right? We have a vice president. And then within each department, we've got middle management all the way down to what we call the street level bureaucrat. The individual on the street who does the work of government, right? If the legislature says, hey, we need to fill these potholes, their job's done. Potholes are a problem, we're appropriating money to fill the potholes. Goes to the governor, right? Most potholes are filled by the state. Goes to the governor. The governor then says, okay, well, this is a road issue. Let's put it into the Department of Transportation. The Department of Transportation is broad. It's not just roads, it's roads, it's waterways, it's airways, it's railways. So we got to go in from transportation into the department that is, right, the roads, and then from the roads to road maintenance, from road maintenance to potholes, and from potholes to the guy with the shovel filling the damn potholes. Or not, the two guys leaning on the pot. I'm just leaning on the shovel. The, 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 the point being, the person down at the end here, they're the ones who actually fix the problem, right? Everything else is making sure the problem gets fixed. Identifying the problem, coming up with a solution, and making sure that solution gets carried out to the person who actually does it. Whether it's the lady behind the Secretary of State's office who gives you your tabs, renews your license, or, or the lady who's going to take your information and give you a ballot, right? they're the street-level bureaucrat within some department. Elections is Department of State. It's always the license tab, by the way, so it's Department of State. Now, if you want to get a permit to build a house, right, it's an environmental issue, you go through a different department. Okay? And so this is typical structure of your bureaucracy. This is how government works. Top down. Middle management, a lot of middle management, down to the individual who actually does the job. Students say, hey, what can I do with a political science job? Or with a political science degree? Any of this. Any of this. Lobbyists, right? Involve the political parties, right? The party structure, right? Run for office. I hope you consider yourself running for office. Run for office. Work in a staff, staff position. I work in a staff position in, in the legislative branch. Work in the executive branch. Get specialized in transportation, road safety, engineering, right? Environmental sciences, right? Finance, current, all with a political science degree background on top of whatever else it is you specialize in. All preps you for these positions. Bobby. All of this. And there's a lot of jobs out there for this stuff. And as we've seen on this last kind of COVID thing, these jobs tended to do pretty good, right? Right? Um, and my son asked, he's keeping my studies studying public policy. He's following in my footsteps and, and he asked for advice, and I told him, I said, look, hey, I don't know what the teacher's going to bring when it comes to technology. I don't know if there'll be the need for teachers. I don't know if AI is going to fix that, take care of that. I don't know if it's going to get shot right into your melon, just like some Google app where you mentally ask Alexa an answer, and she gives you the or a question, I should say, and she gives you the answer. I don't know if that's what education technology is going to But two things I think we're going to always need are cops and politicians. Cops and politicians, and I don't think you can take the human hand out of either of those two things. So I suggest that those are two areas are given. Or computer science, right? Because definitely we're going that route. But uh, he's more of a people person than a. So, so he's studying public policy. And this is all open up to him now. It'll be open up to you as well. All right, so we're getting close to the end here. And just real. Quick. So there are six roles for the executive. Six roles. This is the primary role. This is the big one. This is what makes sense, right? You're going to have a legislature whose responsibility is to come up with 
the, 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 the rules or the solutions to the problems. You need an entity that can carry out those rules. And you can combine the two. Right? The parliamentary system over in England has the, 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 the chief of the government comes from the majority of party, and the, you know, the, so the prime minister is both part of the legislature and the head of the executive branch. But we separated those. Separation of powers, checks and balances. And so you have an executive that's separate from the legislature. We give some authority to this individual to say, look, I represent the whole of this machine. This will not work. What you're telling me to do will not work. I can't do this. I'm not going to do this. That's the veto. I'm not implementing. And the legislature can override that veto and go, mm, yeah, but we have a system where the people actually tell the government what to do. And since we represent the people, and by two-thirds, we... Right? You can force the executive to actually do what the legislature wants it to do. Not easy. Veto power is pretty pretty strong. But every once in a while, vetoes get over it. <laughs> Regardless, the responsibility then of the executive is to carry out those solutions. And by the way, and this is kind of a thing to think about, just because you're a new president right, that wasn't there to veto a bad law that you didn't care for, doesn't mean you get to ignore that law coming in. Once that law has been passed, it's passed. Your responsibility then is to carry it out. Now, if you have a problem with it, you can challenge it into the courts, get into the courts and challenge it, but you can't ignore it. It was very dangerous. Again, it doesn't matter who the president was, but it was very dangerous for a president to come in and say, I have a pen and I have a phone and I'm gonna work my way around the legislature and we're going to get these things done regardless of what the legislature wants or doesn't. Or to come in and say, I know what the marijuana laws are. I'm not going to enforce those laws. And we may all applaud that and say, well, that's the right decision to make. We agree with that decision. But that's that unilateral power of the executive that just does not exist in our system of representative democracy. You follow the laws. You enforce the laws. And if you don't like the laws, you change them. Anyway, again, regardless of who the, pre and the precedent it sets, it just opens the door for that next president who maybe you were happy with the decisions that one president was making, even though he's making them unilaterally, ignoring the Constitution of laws has passed, but you were happy with the decisions they were making. And then all of a sudden, boom, now you've got the exact opposite kind of president in there, and the precedent's been set. Same thing Mitch McConnell said when Harry Reid came out and said, hey, look, you can do away with the filibuster if you want to on judicial nominees or whatever, but remember, you may not always be in charge. And when we're in charge, you open the door. Hmm. Right. So the main role of the president is chief executive, the CEO, the chief executive officer. That's the easy one. It's in the Constitution, right? Executive power shall be vested in the president. That's number one. Number two, number two is commander in chief. Number two is commander in chief. In other words, the president in the same structure is the top of the military, right? And it's the same structure. The mission, military missions, are to fight, win, defend, whatever, and then the president oversees the structure of ensuring that that mission is carried out, right? Rather than transportation and interior and, and treasury, this is now your, your Air Force, right? Your Navy, your Army, your Coast Guard, right? Your Marines are in there as part of the Navy. Your Space Force is in there, I believe, as part of the Air Force now. But that's underneath the president. And so then the different divisions are all aimed at the same thing. A lot of middle management, right? These are your ranked officers, your non-commissioned officers, down to the individual, take the shovel out of their hand, turn that into a gun, and fight and win the wars, right? Same structure. Top down, down to these individuals down here who execute. Commander-in-chief, this guy. Guy at the top. Now, it's not Unilateral, right? It's not <clears throat> without control. Congress is given the power to declare war. 
but the president is given the power to act quickly and then come back to Congress for that support um, if it's there. Okay. So that's number two. Number three is the uh, chief of state. Sorry, chief of state. From time to time, the President of the United States shall give a State of the Union address, which tells all of us the direction that the country is going and should be going and how strong it is. And so in that, we recognize that the President is the voice of the United States. When dealing with foreign countries, it is the White House through whom we deal with foreign countries. Right? No legislator speaks for the United States when dealing with foreign countries. Only through part of the state and the president of the United States. He's that one individual who represents us all. So then you've got four and five, which aren't written into the Constitution, not enumerated in the Constitution, but they are implied by the Constitution. Four and five. This is the president is both the chief diplomat. Right? So in dealing with the foreign countries, that negotiation portion of speaking on behalf of the United States as he represents the whole United States, he's the chief diplomat. And then he's also the chief legislator. You say, but he's not a legislator. He doesn't legislate. No, but the fact of the matter is he's got the veto power. He's got the bully pulpit. He's got the media. And so he the, or she pushes the agenda Right when it comes to policy. They push the agenda. They propose a budget. They, they're the ones who are negotiating right now whether there's more stimulus. So even though they're not a legislator, the fact of the matter is with that veto power, particularly with a very close, divided legislature in terms of overriding the veto, it's a lot of power for the executive to have. And so we consider the president to be the chief legislator, even though they're not a legislator. And then the last, number six, is what we call the chief of the party. And I don't know if you watched the debates, and if you did watch the debate, he, Joe Biden, uh, at one point in time, when we were talking about the Green New Deal and talking about passing course and talking about this, Joe Biden basically said, look, I am the Democrat Party. And there's truth to that, right? The Democrat Party is the Democrat Party, but the standard bearer of the party is the president or the nominee of the other party. They're the standard bearer. They're the ones who are going to drive the party in the decision. The party will get behind them because you don't want that president to look weak. You don't want that president to, uh, you know, to turn tail on the party itself. And so the chief of the party is the last of those powers, the president, those, those uh, roles to president. All right. So we didn't quite get to the Electoral College. It's not a problem. It's a great spot to pick it up on Wednesday. These are the different uh, uh, roles of the president. This is the structure of bureaucracy. This is how it's executed, carried out, right? Legislative branch, Article 2 of the Constitution, right? This is where your power lies. This is where a political science degree might take you. All of this, from lobbying, to interest groups, to political parties, to working on staff, to working in bureaucracy. Right? That's where your power lies. You guys have any questions? All right, remember, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, it's mandatory you're here and that you have your laptop if you've got a laptop. If not, email me, right, so I have some understanding of how many individuals may not have their have a laptop or use of a laptop, okay, for class. And if you don't, not a problem, we'll get you one, okay, but just, just let me know. Otherwise, bring your own laptop in. You might say, I'll just use my phone. No, it's, it, you, could, you could, you could do it through Safari. I just don't want you to use your phone. It's just too too cumbersome to try to use a phone. So come in with a laptop, and if you don't have one, we'll get you one. All right? Okay, guys, have a good one. I'll see you on Wednesday.